And we're talking about Andrei Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev, directed from 1966. To begin, uh, so the film is loosely a biographical historical epic telling of the 15th century Russian icon painter Andrei Rublev. Uh, the film is told in 10 parts. Uh, it begins with a prologue with a medieval retelling of the Disney film Up, um, <laughs> a, 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 involving a man building a hot air balloon. Things go horribly wrong when the locals don't take kindly to this sort of thing. Um, from there, uh, we jump into our first chapter. We join our uh, titular character, Andre, and uh, two fellow monks named Daniel and Kirill, uh, who have left the monastery to go out into the secular world to look for work. On their travels, they encounter a storm and uh, find shelter in a barn with other travelers, uh, where they witness a jester entertaining the masses. And we learn quickly the problem with speaking your mind in a world where authority is uh, answerable to nobody, and they are willing to do whatever it is to shut you up. Chapter 2, we have an exchange between one of the traveling monks uh, from before, uh, Kirill, uh, who meets with uh, Theopanes the Greek, uh, a revered icon painter in his own right. The two hit it off, and Theopanes is so excited at the prospect of having someone who can actually read to talk with, uh, and invites him to become his apprentice on his next project at a monastery, I believe in Moscow. Uh, Kirill only agrees if Theopanes goes to uh, Kirill's monastery and asks him uh, in front of Andrei Rublev. Well, Theopanes follows up on this by sending a messenger to the monastery sometime later, and instead of asking for Kirill, he asks for Andrei Rublev. Kirill is pissed about this and decides to dump this garbage monastery, head out into that secular world full-time, and on his way out, beats a dog seemingly to death for good measure. Chapter 3. Andre and his own apprentice, Foma, on the road, they talk about life and art. Uh, there's a dead swan... They happen to run across Theopanus the Greek again. And then we get Andre recounting the story of the crucifixion of Christ um, that re eerily resembles Peter Bruegel paintings um, in the snow, which is a different place for a Christ crucifixion. Chapter four, we get pagan sex orgy, folks. Am I right? <laughs> that's that's enough, right? Ooh. Boobs. Ooh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, chapter five. An extended home and decoration sequence of a church uh, in a town in a community called Vladimir uh, for Grand Prince Number One. Andre hasn't started on the expected Last Judgment fresco, which comes down to Andre not wanting to use his skill and craft to essentially depict an imagery that is going to instill fear into worshippers. Um, uh, we get to meet the designers of this monastery who are heading out to start work on Grand Prince Number Two's place, the brother of Number One. But Number One ain't having that. And instead of uh, sharing this talent with his brother, he deploys some goons into the woods to gouge out the eyes of the hired contractors because that's a sensible thing to do. Chapter six, uh, Grand Prince number two is obviously pissed and he throws in some, he sends his guys with some, uh, I think it's Tatars, Tatars, uh, tartar sauce, tartar sauces to basically go and raid Vladimir while Grand Prince number one is away. And we get one of the, one long horrifying sequence of a uh, medieval army raping and pillaging and plundering away. Um, yeah, uh, here we get some very deplorable scenes of animal cruelty. Uh, as, and Andre Rublev, uh, he gets to witness this too. He uh, has to kill a man uh, to save a kind of slow woman that is kind of it's an innocent in all this. Um, yeah, chapter seven. Uh, this is entitled The Silence. Uh, after the horrible things that he's witnessed, the, seeing these evils in the world, uh, he has sworn a vow of silence and a vow of not making work again. We get to observe life in occupation in this community now. Um, our favorite dog beater, uh, Kirill, comes back. He is destitute, has learned his lesson about living life in the secular world, i.e. it sucks. It's kind of like grad school. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of just that sequence. Oh, you get, uh, and Kirill wants back in, but he can't get back in until he starts writing out the, the Holy Scriptures out 15 times, which, when you stop and think about it, is insane. Chapter 8, The Bell. And sort of the, the climax of the film, we get to learn the ins and outs of building a bell from scratch uh, with the son of a dead bell builder. And uh, we get to experience Andre watching this whole process and seeing a community come together to build something greater than itself. 
And Andre has a change of heart, and he gets back down to making that art. And the epilogue of the film is a color montage, the whole film's been black and white up to this point, of the actual work of Andre Rublev, which actually isn't that much work, as it turns out I learned after reading a little bit about him. Um, yeah. So, uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about Tarkovsky as well. So, Andre Tarkovsky, the director of this film, this is his second film. Uh, his uh, first feature film was a film called Ivan's Childhood. Um Tarkovsky was born in 1932. He died in 1986. Uh, he's part of a generation of Soviet filmmakers that emerged during the Khrushchev thaw years post-1956 after Khrushchev denounced Stalinism. And that saw an emergence of several prominent Russian directors in a now more liberal cultural climate. So, yeah, you could actually make a movie like Andrei Rublev um, in the 60s. Um, so the history of the film itself is the Soviet Union celebrated the 600th anniversary of the birth of the great icon painter and national hero Andrei Rublev in 1960. Um, Tarkovsky's actor friend Vasily Livinov uh, gave him the idea, who saw himself as the lead. Livinov wound up not being a part of the project in the end, but Tarkovsky pursued it, drawing up a proposal and submitting it. Um, <coughs> the script was published in the official Russian film journal uh, over the course of two issues. Because I guess, like, there was, like, he was already starting to meet resistance about making this film the way he was wanting to, based on the script. Um, but by publishing it in advance, it kind of made the film have to happen because the script was there. So the film was shot between April and November of 1965, at which point bad weather forced the production to close down. The remaining scenes were shot in April and May of 1966. The film was ready for release in August. Permission was granted for its release. Uh, at the time, it was known as The Passion, according to Andre, and clocked in at the 205 minutes that we watched. I just have to stop for a second because I have to get something to drink. I am so dry. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the as dry as this movie. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. Hard yeah. burn on Tarkovsky. Oh, I'm Jared, too, I think. The unprofessionalism, <laughs> far too much. Uh, I'm oh, blow that nose. Hey, I muted it last time. I, f I found the button. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking such shit about you. I bet. How oh. dumb you are and stuff. <laughs> that's, that's fine. That was, oh, nice. That's nice. Um, so the official film industry premiere didn't happen immediately. Uh, by November, Tarkovsky had shortened the film by 15 minutes. More cuts were asked for, and Tarkovsky refused to make them. The film then kind of just lingered. Um, word of its making was spread in the West, and the Venice Film Festival wanted it, but the Soviet Union film body, uh, Voskino, said it wasn't finished initially, which was true in the spring of 66 when they had asked, but the following year they were just saying it was delayed to due to technical problems. Uh, anyway, a series of fortunate events for the film happened, and eventually it was shown abroad to the apparent chagrin of some Soviet officials. Um, all plans to release the film quietly and then bury it were now impossible. The film was publicly shown at the Moscow Film Festival in July, where uh, at the, that time Vice President Brezhnev himself showed his displeasure by walking out halfway through. Um, in 1970, uh, Ingmar Bergman called it the best film he had ever seen. Um, when the film was eventually released in its 185 minute version, uh, in the Soviet Union in December, 1971, five years after the fact, uh, in the West, it was cut even further by distributors like Columbia. Uh, and yeah, so the movie kind of got released, but the 205 minute version that we watched didn't actually get released again until after his death in 1987. Um, and one other thing, I guess is speaking a bit about the Soviet film industry, which I kind of find really interesting. Um, like every other walk of life in the Soviet Union uh, at the time, uh, it was heavily centralized. Uh, Goskino, a body founded in 1922, oversaw every aspect of filmmaking in the USSR, having final say on each stage of the production of a film, from script approval to green lighting of film's release. Uh, I mean, there's, so there's like only, there's 40 film studios in Soviet Union, but all were answerable to this one group. So if you wanted to make a movie, you had to write out your script in advance and submit it to them. Um... And Tarkovsky Studio was Moss Film, which is, uh, they have their own channel on YouTube, which is how you can actually watch the 180-minute version of this film with English subtitles completely for free. So the film yeah. is there. Uh, and yeah, the 205-minute version, there's like a story about how uh, it was like under one of the, like, someone's bed, essentially. And I guess like Martin Scorsese is the one who like found it 
and brought it in to get uh, released by Criterion inevitably. But this is a film that continues to kind of languish uh, in a bad letterbox DVD that Criterion put out way back when um, and probably could use some tender love and care um, because having to watch this on my laptop kind of was annoying. Um, I feel like this is a movie that definitely should be watched on a big screen. Um, the whole time, like I kind of like was trying to create a thing where I had my laptop right up against my chest up to my chin and like put a blanket over my head. So it felt like I was in the theater because <laughs> that's sort nerd. of, that's the sort of nerd I am. Um, yeah. Did it work? Uh, it was better. It definitely, uh, it definitely worked more and it, it made me like less aware of the passing of time. But that all being said, Evan, um, my understanding is you've watched this movie several times and you're a bit of a Tarkovsky fan. So, I do like Tarkovsky, so, yeah. so tell us about your thoughts, feelings, uh, with this movie, this movie in particular. Yeah. I, or, it's or, about or the Tark- third time I've seen it. Okay. I, the last two times I've seen it have been that kind of letterbox cut, um, the, the 205 minute one. And, uh, I watched it this time on YouTube 185 minute cut or thereabouts and it was def- I don't think it even really feels all that much brisker hmm. if anything it's just it's like more uh, confusing and the theological conversations are like less in depth from what I can remember also the most important part is the fool at the beginning of the movie yeah um, at one moment he uh, he does a handstand and his pants kind of fall down or up and you see his ass, and yep. there's like a happy face, and that was that's removed from the 185 minute. Really, cut. there's no reason to watch the 185 minute cut. There's no fool's butt in that, so drops. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. Mm-hmm. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, I remember the first time I watched it. It was sort of like I, I actually was given it to watch for an assignment, and just kind of at that point, I had seen like Doss Boat, and it was like I'm gonna just. I'm just going to treat it like that, where I'm just going to sit down and do this thing, and I'm going to just experience this because I I enjoyed kind of watching the like the TV cut of Doss Boat as uninterrupted as possible for like full immersive possibility or whatever. And I think by the time that the uh, um, the sequence with the bell kind of finishes, it it kind of like it really messed me up. It was pretty great for me at the time in like my undergrad year. This time, um, I think the cut of the film definitely affected my my viewing. So I was expecting maybe to really get into the conversation, uh, the like the writing. Um, but I also don't necessarily. I f- the, the the subtitles on the YouTube Moss Film channel were also like they they for me I I have no knowledge of Russian, um, so it kind of wavered between feeling like it was coherent and then just feeling vaguely broken. So I don't know this time. The cinematography is still beautiful yeah. for me, I guess, but, um, uh, it's got weird blocking the movie. I mean, I'm not really an expert in blocking or anything like that, but there's lots of little, like when, uh, uh lots of little kind of like tricky moments, uh, like when the, the fool leaves the hut at the beginning of the film, he kind of like magically and impossibly, uh, comes to the top of the, like, the the roof of the building and he like falls over the the entrance of the oh, door. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> there's there's actually like a couple of different things like that in the movie. And I uh, like there's actually like an angel in the sequence with the uh, with the crucifixion. And it's kind of hard to notice. I never noticed it before. I think because the letterbox cut is kind of like lower fidelity than the HD cut that's on uh, the YouTube thing. So that's like the one mm. benefit of it is the picture quality is pretty decent yeah. in person. Neat. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, I could I could ramble on a lot like that. Um, I, I the general vibe that that movie gets me is is something that I appreciate, especially not knowing that 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 color sequence was coming at the the ending. First time I watched it, it felt kind of like at the end of this kind of crazy dream. It it kind of felt like reality kind of smacking me in the face again. So um, good stuff. Uh, yeah, okay. I like the movie quite a lot actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's get our cards on the table. RJ, mm-hmm. what did you think of Andre Rublev? Well, boys, my opinion may shock you. I thought this movie was okay. I thought it was all right. Um, I think uh, Jarrett was expecting me to full on hate this movie, which 
isn't quite the case. Uh, I'm not hot on it. I'm not cold on it. Mm-hmm. I'm just in the middle. I'm pretty warm. Uh, as uh, Evan said, it looks great. Like, there's some super nice shots at, like, stuff that fucking people today can't even get right. Like, uh, in the opening, there's that scene where the guy's, like, walking through the building in his sweet bomb-ass jacket. And then uh, the doors open, and you just get the the bright white light coming in and you see his silhouette like it looks fucking awesome uh it looks really good um i think when i watched this and there's all these very deep monologues i thought that i think i would prefer this story as a book um the kind of theological okay yeah, posturing yeah. that people do and stuff like that like i think it's touchy in movies and i think in this one they do it as as good as you could right like it's the like there, there's a lot of movies that try to do that and you're just like come on like just really bad stuff like when i was talking about star trek beyond last week and their dialogue <laughs> is just like death gives life meaning and finding your meaning <laughs> is life and it's just like all right man like yeah we get it this movie or this f- film I'll call it. I thought with like the way they kind of discuss these ideas and these their feeling or like what they think about religion and life and all this stuff. Like it's really it's really good. I think it's the best that you could do it for a movie. But um, for me personally, I think I would prefer it as like a text where I could just read it and that would get let me absorb it better, digest that information a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cuz like yeah. We, that's like the thing with movies is like you're kind of being drugged along at the film's pace. And mm-hmm. especially when you're watching something that's been translated and you're right. like kind of like having to stop and read and then like see like there's a flow going and I mean there's right. also like a conversation. The movie I mean is made for like for like a Russian audience, I think ultimately like when that movie yeah. would have been made. Um so it's like really involved. I think there's like a uh, there's always like that weird disconnect, I think, between like kind of the Eastern philosophy and the Western philosophy of like yes. uh, in, 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 of this religious conversation. Um, I yeah, and sure. so I think there's like something that's like kind of alien, uh, which is going to come to my point. Like when I would talk about the movie a bit, because yep. like I find this movie like we really weirdly unnerving the whole time. Oh yeah, um, yeah. For but sure. continue, yeah. Keep. Uh, uh, oh yeah. So, um, like my my big my big picture is yes, this movie looks great. Uh, it's got some really cool ideas, and I like the concepts that they talk about. Uh, me personally, uh, as you put it, I think it would be easier for me to digest at my own pace mm-hmm. in like a text or something, because that's kind of how I learn stuff better. Um, so I think that would be better for me, but I mean, that's just a personal preference. So like, I'm, I'm kind of just like in the middle, but, uh, I did have notes that I think as I looked at it, I think it lines up with each, uh, little chapter. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just read that. Um, my, uh, so each one of my notes here is for each of the eight chapters, I think. Uh, so my first one was, you're just going to put out that fire with your bare hands because a <laughs> dude just puts out fire with his bare hands. Uh, number two, you're just going to beat that dog for no reason. Cause, uh, this guy just beats a dog for no reason. Uh, number three, you're just going to sit with your legs in an anthill because that old <laughs> fucking guy is just sitting with his legs in an anthill and you see like hundreds of ants cover, following up his legs. And he's like, he's like wiping them off and like swatting them. And it's like, just move, man. Like, why, why would you do that? Um, Number four, you're just going to tar that guy and send him off being dragged by that horse. Oh, you know, that's not even tar. Do you yeah, because I, I didn't know what it was. I, oh, I was, do you know was what? So, yeah, that so that scene is like that is like one of the most terrific things I've seen, I think, in the Criterion Collection and probably in a lot of movies because it's a it's a callback because like earlier when they're torturing the uh, that bishop's messenger guy uh, yeah. for information, um, they are they, they, he mentions like, let me like kiss the cross and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll let you. But what they do is they melt down a cross and so they oh. pour they pour molten metal down his throat, at which point, nice. then, which then you get him screaming silently and making the motions, and it's just dead silence, and then yeah. he gets struck off. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that was fucking grisly. I was really like, because as you said, that's like a huge sequence of just uh, depravity, like, just horror. Yeah, yeah, it's like the greasiest goddamn horror show you ever saw. 
and uh that part caught me so off guard i was just like what the fuck so uh i, I can't remember what that was that was either four or five but uh grizzly stuff mm-hmm. number five hey lady you're just gonna eat that poop from those logs <laughs> there's a scene where this lady's just like eating all this shit from the logs i think it's the slow lady as you called her yeah um yeah. i don't know if it's dump she's eating but it looks like it yeah, it's just meat i think it's just like it's raggedy meat that the guys are oh, throwing that they're throwing the dogs, the dogs? yeah that That's actually like, minds or sorry go on oh, go, go ahead no i was just gonna talk about the, the animal violence there's the dog uh, that scene it's pretty it's pretty violent it's intense but yeah uh, yeah, my uh, my next note was I. This was a note me telling you guys. I'm just gonna skip this part. So uh, full disclosure, there were three times in this movie that I just jumped like five minutes ahead because I was like, uh, nope. Uh, Jared very grac- graciously gave me a timestamp for. Uh, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> I skipped it, but uh, he gave me. It was like a 45 seconds. He was like, just skip this part. So it's very nice because you've never done that before. I've always just had to. <laughs> grit my teeth and or bare my teeth grit through it so i just skipped that part and then the dog part i skipped too well the yeah i mean like you're, you're like when the dog gets beaten to death like when it's like no not that part. Oh. so it's after so that lady's like eating that mangy meat and it's like there's that guy uh who's just throwing like raw meat to dogs mm. and the dogs were like obviously fighting so oh. i didn't know how long it was gonna go so i just jumped two minutes ahead I was like, I was like, if I miss anything, I'll figure it out. Um, because after last week, where there was like Nanook. ten minutes, yeah, ten minutes of dog fights, I was like, I, it's like I'm good. Yeah, what are, what the hell's up with that? Two two Criterion movies in a row, and it's like dogs is getting Just the raw end, and animals <laughs> getting the raw end of the stick, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I skipped that part. Full disclosure for you mm-hmm. boys. But you did watch the uh, the cow on fire. Yeah, that was unmissable. Um, what yeah, really? I, I well, I didn't. I didn't know what was coming, so I couldn't. I couldn't avoid it. But uh, mm-hmm. I think Jarrett said there's a blanket on that cow that yeah, was on there, fire. There, but uh, I mean, the, the, still the, the, on the fire. claim. Yeah, the claim is that it's an asbestos covered coat, and you can actually like. I looked at it because I went back and I was like, okay, really? And I'm like, okay, I can kind of see the line over this thing was, but it's like. Oh man, just for that shot, like, you don't even get a good shot of it. Like it's like not even I don't know. It's like kind of like unsettling, right? I mean, it's going for that vibe of like capturing the horrors of it, but that's that whole sequence, the raid is so monotonous in some ways cuz so many horrific things keep happening and happening and happening. But then right. they, they throw in more stuff. You're like, "Well, did you need this one? Did you need this one?" Cuz uh, I don't know, RJ, do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to describe the scene that you did not watch? Uh, that's up to you. Um, I mean, you gave me the time to skip yeah. it. So, uh, well, I will, uh, I'll describe it. So, you know what you okay. didn't see. Um, okay. so it's a scene involving a horse that's on top of a like flight of stairs that yeah. they, they then push down the flight of steps and then the horse, because it's a gigantic horse, begins to stumble falling down the steps and then falls mm-hmm. like onto its back for like a story, lands on its back, breaks its legs. And then we get like a pan over from the horse struggling on its back to mm-hmm. a bunch of uh, Tatars uh, just like watching this scene. So you're actually seeing these actors watching this horse crawling around off camera. And then the camera pans back toward the horse and the horse has been trying to get back up on its legs, but it can't because its legs are legit broken and then you see then you see it fall to the ground and a man comes with a spear and stabs it in the throat in the throat basically Mm -hmm. um basically what happened was when it while it was off camera it was like shot it it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter um it's like one of like the worst things i've ever seen like in like a movie like i just like i was like what the fuck like i did not know that was coming i had always heard about the cow on fire Mm -hmm. um but so apparently, and this this is the uh, justification. Um, sure. Uh, this was done to avoid the possibility of harming what was considered a lesser expendable, highly priced stunt horse. The horse was brought in from a slaughterhouse, killed on set, and then returned to the abattoir for commercial consumption. Um, because I guess like uh, Tarkovsky had someone shoot this horse mm-hmm. before they had it going down the steps. Um, uh, I. 
it's like beyond like fucked. Like there's no reason that yeah. this could happen at all. Yeah. Um, it's so, like, uh, yeah. so the one interviewer uh, suggested to Tarkovsky that the cruelty in the film is shown precisely to shock and stun the viewers. And this may even repel them. May. In an attempt may. to downplay the cruelty, Tarkovsky responded, no, I don't agree. This does not hinder viewer perception. Moreover, we did all this quite sensitively. I can name films that show much more cruel things compared to which our looks quite modest and, but I mean I don't think he goes on to name anything because that's not true <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I can't think of anything that's like uh man yeah no I think that's all horseshit anything that says it's justified to like express cruelty or like the harsh cruelty of things that's bullshit you're just trying to make an excuse for it and there's no way that the horse was shot like they may have shot it before they pushed it down but the fact that you said that it tries to get up oh, yeah, like, no. it was alive yeah, so yeah, I, that's, I don't that's remember a... a lot of those details. Yep. Mm-hmm. I actually I forgot about the cow entirely. Honestly, yeah. is the cow uh, not it, in it's the brief? Is the cow not in the YouTube cut? As we'll call well, it. Well, that's the thing is that the horse shot in the um, in the 185 cut is cut way down. It's actually yeah. very confusing. Um, mm. I never noticed. It looks like it actually was cut before the shot was started because it's bleeding quite a lot um, yeah. up mm-hmm. its neck, I think. And it's kind of spilling everywhere in a way that's pretty intense. Um, and the shot only lasts for, I think, maybe eight, ten seconds or something like that. It's very brief. And um, I completely forgot about the spearing and everything like that. Um, uh, yeah, it's just I guess those details are things that mm-hmm. – I, I really personally don't agree. Like, I don't think they really, those are the sorts of things that really don't. I, yeah. In I don't, most movies, I, I don't think I can work at all. Well, I mean, like, I always have, like, uh, this goes back to uh, some of my, my wrestling viewing, but there's, like, always this line about, like, Vince McMahon would never ask a performer to do something he wasn't willing to do. And I think that could probably be applied to uh, the use of animals in a movie, where it's like, mm-hmm. would you do that to a human being? <laughs> and it's like, yeah. if the answer is, no, I wouldn't kill a person, then it's like, well, you probably shouldn't do that to the animal either. Um, and the thing is that is, like, humans can actually consent to things where animals don't can't like they're incapable they're property i guess in, mm-hmm. in the view of the law but i mean there's actual you know there is laws that dictate hey you can't do this to animals in films or mm-hmm. you're not supposed to and it's like kind of like a suggestion but we're also talking about uh, a different era in a different country so i mean there's that weird disconnect but when you're watching a movie now uh yeah i mean that can just be like that's it done and i mean i wouldn't blame somebody for just being like i'm out <laughs> on mm-hmm. that because like for even me like I thought like I mean I've watched Cannibal Holocaust several times um, and it's like that movie's messed up but this scene like I don't know maybe because I just didn't expect it maybe I'm growing soft in my old age but I was like pretty like horrified and I guess it's like that's the intent of the scene but it's like not the right kind of horrified like I mean for me having the simulation of a man being having like molten metal poured down his throat that was like horrific but no one that didn't actually have to happen it was all staged and mm-hmm. I, that, that horse scene wasn't in it but i mean there's like this like symbolism of the horse throughout the movie and i guess yeah. this is like this added aspect of the horse dying and it's like no you still didn't have to kill the horse because that's what we're talking about now and it's not about anything about themes about horses and about yeah. horses in russian culture and life and etc etc but uh, any other notes, RJ, from your numberings? Yeah, I, I do have two more. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you guys took the reins on the animal stuff. I, I know I'm a broken record for that, but yeah, I'm glad I, I'm glad I skipped it because if I had watched that, Jarrett, I probably would have stopped the movie. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I just have two more for the last two chapters. Uh, the one was sweet smelting hole under that slave camp. Because uh, uh, if you watch this, they do have a pretty sweet smelting hole uh, under that camp of all those really uh, mal uh, malnourished Russian guys just chopping away. And then uh, my last comment, which is pretty much a summary of the whole movie. Uh, this movie, if I had to describe it in one line, it would just be uh, sad peasants doing sad shit. Yep, yeah. that's that's my <laughs> review of uh, Andre Rublev. Oh. So. <laughs> My house breaks apart. Oh, yeah, because of my my sweet uh, my sweet one liner. It cut it, well, it cut right to it right there. Yeah. Shake the foundation. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's my take. Okay. Um. So my notes follow as 
this movie is very wide. Um, mm. Just like every shot in this movie is like takes full advantage of its. I don't even know what scope this is. Um, I don't know if you know off the hand, Evan, but no. uh, it's just like amazing. Like this movie takes full advantage at all times of its um, of every. Uh, sure. uh, yeah. yeah, like it looks incredible. Um, and like uh, when you were talking about like blocking and like even just composition, like everything is like laid out in such a like particular way that like every shot you could just take a still out of it and be like, yep, that could go on a wall. Like it's like that that kind of like really amazing attention to. Uh, where characters are. Um, I agree. Yeah. yeah. It just, it looks amazing. Um, and then like, but there's also something like uh, weirdly unnerving about everything in this movie. Like every scene, like it feels like I, I, it's like welcoming me into the frame and into like the space. And it's like this horrible place. Like it's the medieval world. And like, I kept thinking about seventh seal watching this movie. And I was really thinking like, Oh yeah. No wonder Ingmar Bergman like loves this movie. Like, cause it's kind of like the movies that he was making, but like he, I don't think he was he ever got to this scale of movie making like because if like Seven Seals like a fairly small tidy little movie, um, but it never really gets to like the scope I think of this movie, um, just in terms of like just uh, like budget or something like that because I don't know I think I think Big Bergman's movies are uh, the ones that I've seen at least I think they're better than this one, but uh, I can definitely see why Bergman would be totally drawn to the subject matter. Um, in this place because I mean uh, he visited the medieval era many times because it's like really great work for like these questions of like humanity and like living in like the shits like being like having being peasants and living in a horrible world and like the only thing that you have in your life to ground you in your day to day existence is the church and so this is a movie about basically that kind of scale up from peasantry kind of like concocting those images and I mean Seventh Seal too I mean there's like that whole sequence of like the um when Max von Sydow's character is at the church at the monastery there. And the one there's like the mural painter talking about like painting these imageries of death and frightening people. And it's like completely carries over right into Andrei Rublev. And I'm really, I'm kind of curious, like how much, uh, of the, of like say some seal, uh, Tarkovsky was able to watch while he was in film school, uh, oh, like in the fifties. Yeah. Cause like I watched, I watched, uh, Tarkovsky's first student film, um, the killers. Like that. What's that? Oh, the killers! Oh no, I thought you there's a steamroller one. Above. Yeah, that that's his third thing that he did. His very first student film though is the Killers, which is on the uh, Killers Criterion Collection. It's like a 25 minute thing. I think you can find it online too. And I mean, it's super like American noir influenced, uh, but it's kind of like funny because it's that geeky film school thing where like you want to film a movie of dudes in fedoras and being tough, but all you know are like guys who are like 22 and like, so they look like just kids wearing these big hats and jackets and they're being tough. Um, but like I was watching, I was like, I wonder like how much like film noir Tarkovsky would have been able to see, uh, in like Soviet Russia. Like, I'm not sure like what the flow of, uh, film was like. I don't think it's as oppressive as like, uh, 1950s America would lead us to believe it was like, I'm pretty sure that they wanted to like make the best stuff. So they were watching art and film and stuff like that to a certain degree, at least to their own like socialist ends. But uh, I mean, I'm sure that they were aware of world cinema, be it American or uh, Swedish. Cause I can, I can't imagine uh, Tarkovsky making this movie, not knowing about seven seal. Cause there's so many little things that are touched upon um, just like the, like the, all, like the gesture characters and stuff, but maybe it's just medieval tropes that uh, are more uh, universal than I, I'm aware of. Um, I'll paraphrase badly, but there is like a, a Tarkovsky quote uh, that goes something along the lines of the only two people that I care about, like their opinions on my movie are like Ingmar Bergman and like Robert Brisson. Oh, so yeah. I'm, I, I'm probably badly paraphrasing that. I don't know when he said that, but yeah. he definitely was an admirer of, of uh, Both Bergman. Those. Yeah. Yeah. So if the shoe fits, the shoe fits, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's like, yeah, I guess going to like that weird, like that alien feeling watching this movie. I mean, it also feels like there's like a real surrealism to this movie um, that I think probably made like the, the communist party, like kind of have its back up to it. Cause you get the scene where like after that, uh, right in the prologue, when the uh, hot air balloon crashes with the man and you cut to that horse rolling around on the, in the, on its back, um, mm. and then getting right back up, uh, in this symbolic sort of gesture. But like, I was just like, Oh, like all this like photography in it. Like there's something about like surrealist art usually finds itself in sort of these minimalist back 
drops. Like they're usually in just like these empty fields of like roving hills. Like there's not a lot of like something there to like distract you from. Um, it's because it's just about these weird characters moving around like a Beckett play or something like that. Um, like where it's like absurdist sort of thing. Um, mm. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, um, here's my note. Seven Seals, Russian cousin. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I imagine this movie is like a, it's sort of like the the granddad to stuff like uh, Bella Tarr's movies, like Workmeister Harmonies, and yeah, something definitely. and like Hard to Be a God, like these huge black and white momentous movies that um, like are just like about ideas, like real hard ideas. Um, mm-hmm. And like, kind of like the characters are like, it's not about characters. It's kind of not really about the story, but it's about just these like big moments, uh, like over the course of like two, two to three hours. Like they're always long movies. They're black and white. Like they're very austere, serious. Uh, like these things that we typify as like Eastern European or whatever. Um, like this movie seems to like started that, but like, it's kind of strange. Cause like having seen a few other, uh, Tarkovsky movies, I find this movie very different. Um, yes, from yeah. those, like, like there's a big difference between this and Solaris. Um, cause like Solaris and stalker kind of occupy a far more similar space that I think, mm-hmm. uh, people will like a lot more. Cause I think this movie kind of like, I'm surprised how well regarded this movie is. Cause I can't imagine like a lot of people being super big fans of it. Like I'm like, I'm on, I don't know. I'm not that far off from RJ with this movie. Like, I don't know if I, I don't love it. Um, mm-hmm. but I mean, I'll, I'll think about this movie a lot like just because that's uh, why I've come back to it is there's it's like a especially when you watch a lot of these kinds of uh, for me and I haven't I'm not the most uh, uh, comprehensive viewer of like festival films um, or films by people like Belatar or whatever but uh, uh, you, you do feel stylistic influence um, from people like Tarkovsky kind of sprinkled around a lot um, and then if you watch a lot of movies beforehand, like, I mean, that's one thing I think you're saying the scope of the production of something like Seventh Seal um, might not have had enough money. I think it's also just yeah. the, it's a very different intent. Like, and I think that's what makes Tarkovsky movies very interesting for me to watch is they have very specific and sort of ambiguous intent. It, and, it's, and that's the, the tension between how specific it is and how... Um, open they really are especially i think the 70s stuff stuff like solaris and stalker especially basically from like the mirror stalker onwards and then get into like the 80s stuff and stuff it gets pretty loose like very loose and uh pretty open to interpretation in a way that's that's i find to be really exciting to, to see especially because they are photographed pretty much like no other no other movies the, the quality of movement i know some people complain about movies like children of men and they say that there's no need to have these kinds of excessive or gravity these kinds of excessive tracking shots that uh or rope i guess you could uh you could throw in there too the hitchcock movie russian it's arc kind of, <laughs> yeah or russian arc yeah like these technical show-off movies and i think they it just i don't know i just have got to have a little bit more faith in like the the directors just trying to do it you know for the sake of doing it and that's that's not a great argument, obviously. I think it definitely can feel indulgent at times, but um, I, I don't feel like it is indulgent in Tarkovsky at the very least. I, I heard this thing that he would edit according to the tension of time in a shot, which I don't... It, it sounds ambiguous, but it's just kind of like you, you have... You shoot with this style... And then you, when, when you're editing, you feel you feel the pressure building in in it according to how much is happening in the frame. I guess I, hmm. I'm not sure. I think to me that doesn't sound like unique though. That seems like I think most good directors probably edit the same way. Maybe it was just articulated that way when talking about him because it feels like to me like there's like a natural pacing. I think like there's like a a natural feeling when you're watching a movie that like, you know, there should be a cut here. And like, you mm-hmm. you know, when they miss that moment, you're like, why isn't this cut away yet? <laughs> and like, either like, it's like, it sh- it's so good that you never think about it or it brings attention to itself or it's badly edited. And the only time you ever, I mean, the, the, the cliche is that you don't notice editing until it's bad editing. It's kind of like sound design or music too. Like where it's like, mm-hmm. you don't notice those are happening until 
they bring attention to themselves and usually for the wrong reasons um or until like, you start like unless you start looking for it specifically um like then there's like really great examples of it and you're like wow look at this like look because people don't usually go man that sound design other than you probably evan <laughs> you're just, i think you're the uh, one of the few people that will be like yeah the sound design's like really good like off the bat before you talk about anything else um <laughs> but like i think most people it's like yeah you would they don't even know like other than they know like a shot like that for me was like when I first started like watching movies in a closer way I would notice that like why why didn't why is this shot holding why are we still looking at I don't know this person like it should have cut away already this scene's going on too long it's going on too long mm-hmm. what the hell's going on and it's like not in a good way we are like it's building tension in itself uh, but anyway sorry uh, that was just like I don't know so I mean the Tarkovsky stuff it's like yeah I mean I don't think he, he doesn't have like a lot of super tense editing his stuff seems to be like scene set up particularly when uh, with something like Stalker where it's just like long takes and so the movie feels like three times longer just because it's long takes um, but and like, loose mm-hmm. structure as well um, yeah yeah because yeah. it's like it, there's no rush there's no rush to get to the, the plot right it's just about building scenes up I, I think that's maybe why the thing with the Tarkovsky thing with the tension in the shots, it, it's, it makes more sense in the context of stuff like The Mirror or Stalker or something like The Sacrifice. Um, some of it's like really specific. Like apparently the, the, the shot of the house burning at the end of Sacrifice is this crazy shot of this house burning. Um, uh, it was like very highly timed out down to like the second. There's that and then there's this, this kind of, I don't know. I, I don't believe in the the, the thing of uh, like I said I'm a little bit wishy washy with films. I don't know if, know if I necessarily believe in in that thing about what Tarkovsky says apparently or apparently uh, of uh, editing to the tension point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it makes more sense though in something like Stalker because there is some there's some really really loose stuff in that movie and it, it feels it, it doesn't feel inappropriate for me like it, it suits the movie quite a lot and I think the reason why it's justified in terms of its feeling is in part due to the the tension of the editing and maybe tension is not the right word for it but the the timing you know and the attention to it i guess but um yeah uh so how would you place uh andre rublev in that trajectory of where tarkovsky's going like where do you see like things carrying uh-oh. over i can't remember i think solaris comes next i can't remember 100 percent in terms of like the chronology of someone like kubrick for me is very clear sure uh, uh I think it, if you see Ivan's Childhood, which I would recommend, if you thought yeah. this was like pretty interesting, I think Ivan's Childhood would be up your alley for sure. Mm-hmm. It's more, it's more, um, it's more movie like in the old school way, where there's yeah. moments where things happen um, that they their gestures of action between characters um, combined with lighting and movement and and sound in a way that's it's very elegant. Yes, uh, yeah, it, it's, it it's far lot- more of a movie. Yeah. Yeah, it actually feels a lot more like a Kurosawa film. Yes. Uh, that's, and yeah. I, I would say that this ha- that's one thing about this film that's interesting is that it really, I think there's some things in Ivan's Childhood that feel pretty cool and, and unique, but I think this is the first one that feels full on Tarkovsky for me at times. There's there's moments that's like um, the crucifixion scene has a bit of that in terms of its... Uh, it's I, it's surprising when it comes. It's unexpected. I mean, right? Uh, uh, it's unexplained. It's dreamy, but in a concrete way. Uh, it's not like a like a Bunuel dream scene where it's almost like a joke. Um, it 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 is more painterly, which sounds kind of faffy, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's stuff like that, and then also when when they are uh, when they're lifting the bell. Like that, there's no. It's like old school epic filmmaking in the sense where you've got like mm-hmm. thousands of people on screen at once. Um, well, and I was, uh, I was really thinking about uh, my one note was like uh, Herzog's Fritz Caraldo, just oh, like yes. that whole process. Like because you feel the weight of everything, like you feel the process happening, and like they actually are doing this. Like they're they're not. This isn't movie magic. This isn't matte paintings. This is like no. We actually have to get this bell up and and levied, and like you get the, and it's all using like the. It, it appears to use like the technology of the period depicted. It's like it feels like it's fourteen hundreds. Um, and you get to experience it all. And yeah. mm, 
I saw a crane uh, yeah. drive in just in the side for a second. They didn't edit it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tarkovsky, so sloppy. Yeah. Shyster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, something like Mirror is, I, I think, maybe stylistically is most interesting because it incorporates things like found footage. Um, and it's a nice balance of use of things like uh, autobiography as well. Um, as and and also, there's a higher degree of kind of ambiguous um, setups and scenes that play off of each other, in, in, and it's also a combination of like some of the best cinematography. Like when it's combined with, um, it's hard. There's like an intimacy, the grandeur brought to of those kinds of camera movements brought to this intimate movie scene. That's what's one of the things that's so beautiful about it because it's, it's because it's a memory movie. And um, it's one of those things that's like, I don't know, like uh, someone like Denis Villeneuve tries to do where they become like puzzle box movies about, you know, being inside of someone's headspace or something. And they're fine. They're, they're fine movies. But the, the openness of a movie like Mirror feels more honest to me to like the ambiguity of memory, which sounds like once again, sounds faffy. But like uh, that's why, why I come back to these movies is that there's there's stuff in some other kind of like self-serious films that that just like I don't really care, you know? And then when I think about my own life and, and, and the things that really make me sad, like knowing people who have lost their memories or um, when the, 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 the tension of someone being dead and then being out of your life, uh, something like an Andrei Tarkovsky movie does that more for me. Like I said, it's a bit self-serious, but... Um, Compared to a lot of other films, it doesn't uh, like I don't even go to S- uh, Scorsese for that, really. I, it's and uh, or anything like that, you know. Uh, there's different things that those movies do for me personally, anyway. So uh, that's why I come back to him over and over again. RJ, so, oh, so uh, RJ, what, what, how do you feel about your first Tarkovsky? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like I said, like. Like uh, it looks good, and I like what they're talking about. I'm just uh... if you feel like you should be reading this as a book. Well, like I found yeah. like because I, I found when I was watching it, I found that actually reading like the Wikipedia like breakdown of everything helped yeah. a little bit because there's times where I was like, especially like your three like characters, your three monks, they look similar enough, mm-hmm. and they're not like oh, it's Tom Cruise as Andre Rubov. It's not like they're like these actors that jump out and are distinct looking. Because like initially when uh, uh, Kirill is talking to the um, the Greek monk, uh, I, I thought that was Andre Rublev lying for some reason. Like I, my scene was like, is he pretending to not be Andre Rublev to have an honest conversation? Um, like that's that was my first initial mm-hmm. reading because at that point I had no idea – what he actually looked like and I knew the movie yeah. was titled this but then I started realizing of course afterwards that this movie is like like Andre Rublev sort of like not even like the main character like he's like not yeah. he's not in a lot of the movie uh, which doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't matter to me one way or another um, and it wasn't it's not like a biopic um, but mm-hmm. yeah like, like I said like I I'm glad I finally have watched it but I I think like Ivan's childhood Ch- Ivan's childhood I definitely liked more cuz it, probably cuz it's a bit more conventional it's like a war movie um but I mean it's kind of neat kind of coming between this and Andrei Tarkovsky uh, as uh Rublev um there's like there's the, there's like the other Russian films that I've watched like something like Come and See and there's like <laughs> reference and there's references in that to this um, yeah and then like something like I think it's V V I Y which is like the first like Soviet horror film yeah, and again a- but again it's like peasant life like it's these like uh, constantly these like it's all about the people. I guess like, I mean, that's like a, that, it's obvious saying it out loud. That's like a driving force of, of, um, cause I mean like you wanted to depict the life of like the peasants being shitty because like it's under that of a, of the, the, the grand princes of, of the old school that like worked, were murdered and killed and taken out because everyone needs to be created equal. I mean, that's like uh, probably how the film got sold to the party at the time. But at the same time, it's about an artist who is making their work under an oppressive regime at the end of the day. So, I mean, the film is Mm. kind of in itself subversive 
um, because, yeah. and that's why this movie was probably a resistance to it because they weren't sure. They, they these guys might have seen that, and then they'd be like, "Oh, I don't know if he's like smarter than us, or if we're just seeing things, we're giving him too much credit." Yeah. I, I think the other thing too is like the most populistically uplifting scene is that they they finish making the bell, and and then everyone just kind of leaves. You know, I, I, yeah, because I don't know. It's not really a crowd movie either. No. I never <laughs> noticed it until I watched this movie. But in the final scene, the fool from the beginning of the movie, yeah. he, he shows he shows his ass, and then he and he makes fun of the oppressor, the, the oppressors, and he gets dragged off to jail. And I always thought that he died, and then um, he actually shows up at the end of the yeah. movie. I, t- I never noticed that until this time, uh, this viewing. Um, and then also the, uh, the 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 God's fool woman, like the 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 slow woman or whatever. Yeah, the, the, the simpleton. Yeah. And I and I I get I get why they're there. I think it's supposed to just kind of tie the movie into a bit more of a knot. But it I don't think it really connects in the way that it could if it was a more obvious sort of set of gestures or right. whatever. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I'd say, like, yeah, there's, like, a lot of things in the movie, considering it's, like, stature is, like, one of the great films. I was, like, during the raid scene, I, I never felt, like, the intensity that that's, that, that should have. I, I should have felt in me like I compare mm-hmm. it to like in in come and see the kind of the equivalent to the raid scene in that when the Nazis show up that's like one of the most like intense horrific things I've seen in a movie like it's so like wild and out of control and you're like oh my god like no one's going to survive this and like the raid never really hits those it has some like amazing visuals but then it relies on killing a horse and setting a cow on fire and yeah. like and then like oh we're going to simulate uh, pouring mol- molten metal down this guy's throat and you get those sort of scenes and then like rape and plunder mm-hmm. off camera like t- typical movie whereas like you know uh, uh, over a decade later Come and See comes out and they do like it's or 20 years later uh, and they, they, they do like that scene and it's just like so for, so much more uh, visceral and those scenes that like don't quite pay off or, like with callbacks with characters coming back um, like with the jester and actually one thing I've, I'll mention too is like a, the scene with the jester at the beginning uh, I really like they kind of show like how effortless the jester's job is and like how he's like doing this stuff it's like lowbrow stupid but everyone's into it but then like this drunken asshole he starts trying to do the same gimmick and everyone's like bored with it. They're not laughing because there's like kind of like there's a sort of this like there's a subtle thing about like the artistry of being even like a jackass. And like mm-hmm. you, you, have yeah, to be, you, have, you have to be good at your craft. You can't just like not anyone can just pick it up, which I guess like you could tie back maybe into this idea of like the artist or whatever. Like there's a like, craft in even being uh, yeah, a jester um, and like not anyone can just do it. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit for me. It's a lot of I don't know. I remember just watching it. it. It gave me a buzz watching it. But it's another one of those things where I can never. It's like RJ. Have you heard of that come and see movie? I have. Yeah, yeah. I've heard. Um, I, I'll watch it one day, but uh, I'm a little um, intimidated by it. It sounds pretty uh, raw. It, it, yeah. Raw. It's it's long. It's like it's a solid movie. Um, like it is like it kicks your ass. It's not like. It's not as brutal as, like, I guess you could be led to believe it is. But, I mean, it's like a movie. It's like it's a war movie that really captures the awfulness of war in a way that, like, most mm-hmm. movies fail to. Like, it's a real horror. It's like a horror war movie. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, come and see. Like, I've only ever watched it once. And it's like, man, that movie. Yeah. But what hit me with a rewatch of Come and See was the Nazis are, are very cartoonish. Yes. Uh, and and I think just to compare that to Andre Rublev, the the Tartars don't feel so uh, one dimensional. Uh, they're they feel out of place, but they also have a sort of personality to them that's it doesn't feel as cartoonish to me. I mean, I, it's hard for me to really articulate why I feel that. It's mostly just like a gut level reaction to it. But like you come and see, they like pick their teeth with knives and stuff like that. Like the SS officer has like a yeah. weird key pet, like some evil Bond villain thing or something. It's pretty wild, yeah. well, but yeah. it's also like really I, raw. I, yeah. I kind, of, I kind of, but I see. I would link that into like sort of like uh, we've had conversations before about like Zulowski movies, where it's oh, not yes, so much yeah. about like literally depicting things as they are, but like kind of picking, like taking or showing this like the psychological space of like the Nazis, like where it's like it's cartoonish, but it's like how do you depict this evil? 
and like make it like really like relatable on a screen and it's like making people as uneasy as possible and so like you're depicting them in this like outlandish way that's like way more like I have no idea what's going to happen next because it, suddenly the rules of reality have been thrown out and suddenly the, and that's like the thing like under the Nazis the reality was thrown out for like a decade like no one knew what, what was going to happen next to them like and it was unbelievable and I think that's like what that movie captures really well in that like final act where it's just like I don't know what's going to happen next whereas in Andre Rublev it doesn't go for that like it's like it's not doing that's a completely different type of movie um i think it's more fatalistic it's kind of like it doesn't it doesn't really get involved i mean there's like that's kind of the joke at the end of seven seal too is like they're all dead now um right and i think if anything that's mm-hmm. like maybe where barry linden gets its cue for tone is something like andre rublev where hmm. it's just like they're just kind of just it doesn't really matter that andre rublev is um doesn't have like he doesn't have a huge there's not a, a big thing in the movie about him being romantically involved with anyone like it's a part of his life that he's kind of around these women occasionally but it's not really no like, yeah. there's no conversations about romance or anything like that they're just and it doesn't really matter and it's just kind of uh, like the textures of life I guess I yeah I yeah. I, I, yeah. Ramble, hmm. ramble. <laughs> ramble, ramble. But hey, guess what? Guess we're going to find out who hates this movie from Ooh. our good friends on Letterboxd and the lowest oh. ratings of Andre Rublev there. Nice. <laughs> so from Injun, who gave this film half a star, uh, he watched this for the 2016 movie challenge for in July, the Soviet Union. Uh, number 17, a hot air balloon, naked people, and a bell. Not much to say about a movie in which a bell gets more screen time than the protagonist, except that it was painfully long, excruciatingly boring, overly verbose, and contained a few horrific scenes of animal cruelty. There you go. Now, uh, mm-hmm. we have uh, from A Small Pony, Half a Star. Ooh. At no point in the hours I spent watching this did I care about anything that happened to anyone in it. I was just watching <laughs> events, and I could not understand why anything mattered to anyone. Yeah. I suspect that this was not entirely the point of the film either, so it doesn't even win points for execution of a theme. I wish I could pretend my boring work was banned for any reason other than being what it is. Mm. Mm-hmm. I uh, I kind of sympathize with this review a little bit. Okay. There, there were times where I was like, I don't know what I'm watching. <laughs> I don't know why I should care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I guess you know, that's another whatever. thing admit, with Tarkovsky. Rewatching them is honestly like, I, there's a lot of stuff in Solaris, like when I rewatched that movie. And that's like one of the more straightforward ones that I just completely forget. Like a lot of scenes, like the last time I rewatched it, it was like, oh yeah, like this whole chunk of this movie, I just completely forgot about. Um, rewatching this movie, like it becomes more coherent with time. And, mm-hmm. but yeah. I should say also sometimes I think the cringier reviews are the five star reviews for movies. <laughs> yeah, where they try and like really like blow air up their own butts for getting it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, one more here. Uh, this one's a little lengthy. Uh, one and a half star uh, by Pus. Pulcinella? 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 Uh, Andre Rublev is a 60s biopic, which I, I saved it just because I love referring to this movie as a biopic, of the titular medieval iconographer directed by Andre Tarkovsky. The movie's strong religious thematic makes it a wonder what it he was even made in the Soviet Union in the first place, but it was screened only outside of Russia for quite a blah, blah, blah. Um, and about some sexual scenes and depictions of animal treatment. Okay. Um... Tarkovsky has always been hit or miss for me, but Andrei Rublev, Andrei Rublev is such a catastrophic failure of a film that mm. I find the high praise for it absolutely flummoxing. The biography of a medieval icon painter has some of the worst qualities a film can have, an artificially prolonged runtime filled with loads of tedious and pointless scenes, similar characters who are easy to confuse. Also, I love how the camera is often positioned behind them so you can have no clue who's talking, and a clumsy character development. The atmosphere is nothing like in Tarkovsky's other works. Here, things are happening on screen, but it's impossible to care for any of it. There's just nothing to grab your interest, and to top it off, the pacing is terrible. Usually, the dialogue in Tarkovsky's films never match the power of his images, but here, the dialogues are so painfully bland and disengaging that it just makes the film even more tedious to sit through. Everything this movie has to say about artistic growth and creativity is single-handedly made irrelevant by the fact that it fails on every possible aspect except for the impressive black-and-white photography. And they go on for a bit more. 
Um, then the they movie go f- on as long as this movie does. Oh, then the Final. movie fails at being thought provoking to make a viewer think you need to make him engage in what's going on in the film. To do that, you have to make the film interesting from the beginning onwards. There's rarely a scene to catch your attention and the characters introductions felt all wrong. The pacing is nothing like in stalker or even, uh, Zerkalo. As the mirror. I think. Oh, okay. Here, yeah. almost every scene feels inconsequential, and so much, so much can be cut from the film to make it better. I don't, I don't know. I don't see what you could cut. Like, I honestly think back on the movie, and it's like the movie is exactly what it needs to be. Like, I don't know what you would cut out. Like, mm-hmm. and nothing feels too long. Like, I don't know. It's a strange movie. It is long, um, but I don't know. I never felt it was like because of like, oh, it's excessive. Like, it's just like, no, every scene's there. You can question what the purpose of scenes are, but you, I would never say like, oh, you could lose that. Like, it's kind of like, no, it's, mm-hmm. it's all decided. It's all like intentional. <laughs> it's not an accidental bad movie that was like thoughtlessly put together. Mm-hmm. Anyway, some people don't like this movie. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I really honestly feel like there's not that many movies like this from the time period. I, I, it's like would the same person give a movie like Soy Cuba, which is like a like a Cuban uh, sort of like social realist film? I've never seen it, uh, so me bringing it up is kind of bullshit. But like, uh, like would the same person just rate that higher? I don't like the star rating system. It doesn't make any sense to me on so many levels because it's just it comes down to hyper subjective kind of like trying to prove points about like, you know, enough about Tarkovsky to say that it is a half star movie or something. Yeah. Like, what does that even really mean? Like the fact that somebody kept it under their bed for decades, <laughs> that at least one human being was like, I need to store this and it's going to be under where I, I sleep for a third of my life. I, I don't know. Well, that, uh, yeah. Mm. There's always this thing though. People like get really mad when they're like told this is one of the greatest films ever made and they go in kind of wanting to hate something. And if there's like any reason for them not to like it, and if it goes against the grain of like everything they kind of like in movies, then they're just going to have a heyday talking about, I hate this movie. What a waste of my life. I hate citizen Mm -hmm. Kane, but like that's all like some people go in. They're just like setting themselves up to dislike things. Um, And it's kind of like a, I assume that like I can guess the age of a lot of people um, it being letterbox, social media. They're probably all people in their like early, te- like late teens, early twenties that like have something to prove. There's a lot of, there's some, like something to show and like, I know better than people who watch movies and they're wrong. You should all watch Moonlight instead. Like that's kind of a, like they're, they're about modern movies and they can't imagine anything else than that. But I don't know. That's like this in the star system for me. I, I use it as like kind of like uh, a recommendation system. Like I try to use it as like this person likes these sort of movies. And now I can tell that this person likes these type of movies strongly. And if I That's also fair. and if I also like those, it's it's a it signals to me what they're into. And if they're like, oh, if they like all these movies that I like a lot and they like these five movies I've never seen and giving them five stars, those are five movies I could take under recommendation for me to seek out and go out of my way to watch. That's kind mm-hmm. of like the entire purpose, I think, of star ratings for me. It's like a practical, like, it's like, um, it's more sharp than like going on Amazon customer reviews where everyone gives everything five stars. It, it succeeded and it's a goal five stars. And then like, if it's like I had a, the, the packaging on my uh, shipment was like bad. So it's a one star product. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. And that's mm-hmm. sometimes like how uh, letterbox reviews can work uh, where people don't understand star systems. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, fair enough. Yeah. I guess I don't either then. But what, what are your thoughts on the star system, RJ? I am neither pro nor con stars i don't really give a shit <laughs> I, well, I, I i do it because it's like yeah it's well i guess my point is go back to my creeps i gave fucking ace ventura five stars you know why <laughs> because i think it's a fun fucking movie so i don't know whatever <laughs> well, I, I, I noticed rj you continue to refuse to give martyrs its five star review uh yeah um that one i will say i i do think it it is a a very good horror movie and it is probably five stars uh but uh i've never talked about this on the show i don't think but when i watched that i watched it with roommate scott and it fucking broke him for three days like he was he was he was pretty down for like three days just emotionally distraught so um there there's your five star review i guess but, but, <laughs> well I, i'll watch it again one day maybe and uh, we'll yeah. see but uh 
Yeah. Um, I've only seen that movie once and like I, I'm always afraid of rewatching that just because I'm afraid that uh, it just won't live up to my like that first experience. Mm-hmm. And I don't want that taken away from me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw it twice and I, I, I it didn't really get worse for me. Mm-hmm. Although I think compared to some stuff, it might age pretty okay. I think it's going to age pretty good. But mm-hmm. that's all I can say right now. Like I think the new Godzilla movie, Shin Godzilla is going to age okay. Oh, yeah. Nice. Huh. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I keep forgetting to watch it. It's worth it. It's worth I it. I don't know how. Illegally right now, but uh, I mean, uh, it's going to be out soon, like on Blu-ray yeah. or something. Like, it's inevitable, but yeah, I mean, like, I just, like I always forget. I'm like, oh, yeah, I watched like all like 29 Godzilla movies last year. I guess I should be excited to watch this new one, particularly yeah. since like half the directors like made like one of the best animated series of all time. Yeah, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that because my... My vibe with it was compared to the last Godzilla. It um, it it feels more in line with this idea that Godzilla is like an unstoppable, almost omnipotent sort of being. Omnipotent's not the right word, but like uh, near unstoppable force of uh, nature. I mean, that's why I call it Godzilla. It's like it's like a god. Yeah. You know, it's like literally, there's nothing they can really do, and. Um, the the inability for any kind of bureaucratic governmental structure to to confront it and some of the best stuff of that movie is it's just like a comedy basically where people are trying to it's more of like an illustration of how people would fail to 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 respond to it um, which sounds kind of bad to like drag that gag out for like twenty thirty minutes but they really I think they do a good job of not 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 rushing it or or wasting it. Like I watched a W.C. Fields movie the other day, <laughs> and it's only an hour long. Like God, like why not make Office par- like Christmas Party like not sixty minutes long, you know? And make it just like tight, real good. I don't know. Anyway, there's a there's a gag in in this W.C. Fields movie called It's a Gift. Um, oh yeah, yeah. He he tries to fall asleep for twenty minutes, and just he keeps getting interrupted by noises going off, and that's it's stupid, but like. Oh god! Like I laughed, you know. Like who cares? Mm-hmm. It didn't feel it didn't feel uh, inappropriate um, for it to go on. Um, although maybe it's inappropriate for me to go on talking anymore. <laughs> it's like two hour long podcast. That's, I don't know how, how long do you guys is about two hours for you guys. Yeah, this, about, this, this is about typical. Yeah. This is yep. about it. No. Okay. Um, well, I think we can end it uh, here. Uh, well, I think we've settled it. Uh, Andre Rublev. It's no uh, Ace Ventura pet detective. <laughs> no, it's not. Few movie, few films are Jer. Well, it could use more animal love. Actually, like Ace Ventura has animal love. There you go. Ex- exactly. He's pet friendly. You, you heard it first here on the creeps. Uh, well, after the break, uh, we're gonna forge a bell and fight Tatars. Pardon?